The Red River Expedition in 1870 was the last ever British-led military campaign in North America. It was also the first campaign led by Victorian military hero Sir Garnet Wolseley. Its fame is not for the battles fought. In fact, there were no battles fought. But in Wolseley's ability to transport his army over 600 miles through the Canadian wilderness without losing a single life. His level of planning and sheer audacity became the hallmarks of his future campaigns. And in this Red River expedition, he started to gather the first officers of his fabled Wolseley or Ashanti Ring. So what was this campaign all about and why did it take place? This is the story of Garnet Wolseley and his Red River expedition in 1870. In 1867, the Confederation of Canada came into being, combining the British province of Canada, which is modern day Ontario and Quebec, with their other territories of Nova Scotia and New Brunswick. This self-governing dominion within the British Empire under new Canadian Prime Minister John Macdonald was keen to expand westwards, all the way to the colony of British Columbia on the Pacific coast. To further this ambition, the Canadian government purchased a huge swathe of land to their west from the Hudson Bay Company. Unfortunately, the people in this area were not consulted in the process and were, not surprisingly, concerned as to what the heck was going on. None more so than the Mete population centred on the Red River near modern-day Winnipeg in what is now Manitoba. The Mete were descended from French trappers and hunters who had entered the area in the 18th century and local Native Americans. These French-speaking Roman Catholic frontiersmen had very little in common with the new Canada to their east. They were concerned that they had not even been consulted with regard to this transfer, and they were going to be second-class citizens. This fear was not helped when Canadian Premier Macdonald appointed a governor for the Red River area. The Mete feared that they were not going to be equal partners in this new Canada, but a mere colony. And that raised concerns over their very future. They had farmed the area for generations, but as usual in frontier regions, they didn't actually hold any legal title to that land. They could end up being landless. The Mete decided to take up arms to protect their livelihoods, traditions and their freedoms. Their leader was 24-year-old Louis Riel. His armed men turfed out government surveyors who'd arrived to parcel up the land and blocked the arrival of the new governor, who was forced into a humiliating retreat. Riel and 400 armed supporters then took over Fort Garry, which is now part of the city of Winnipeg. In February 1870, at a convention, the majority of the Red River settlers agreed to establish a provisional government to represent their concerns, and they elected Riel as their president. This provisional government then sent a list of demands to the Canadian government. For those of you thinking this was a war of independence, you might be surprised to find that one of the key demands was to be able to join the Confederation as a full province, just like Ontario and Quebec et al, and not as a colony. They also demanded that their previous rights and lifestyle be protected. In July 1870, delegates from the Provisional Government and Canada signed the Manitoba Act, which did indeed allow Manitoba to join the Canadian Confederation as a province. But, by the time the Act was signed, events had somewhat overtaken the treaty. British settlers in the Red River region, who were locally in the minority, tried to stage an armed revolt against Louis Riel. The result was that one of their leaders, Thomas Scott, was arrested, tried and executed by Riel. The execution of a Protestant English-speaking Canadian by the French-speaking Mete rebels caused an outcry in Ontario. Demands rose for Riel to be brought to justice and the Mete to be put in their place. The problem for Prime Minister Macdonald was that he had no way of physically installing the rule of law in the wilderness, let alone getting Louis Riel and his supporters to lay down their weapons. Whilst there were Canadian militiamen who had countered recent Fenian invasions from the United States, he just didn't have the manpower to take on hundreds of armed Mete. So he turned to the British government in London for assistance. His counterpart across the Atlantic was William Gladstone. <laughs> Regular viewers will have come across Gladstone in my various videos about the British Sudan campaign in the 1880s. You may recall that William Gladstone was not a fan of empire 
or the expense that went with the military expeditions that went with it. Surely, in his mind, one of the reasons for a Canadian Federation was so they could manage themselves and reduce the financial burden on Britain. Self-government meant taking the responsibility for internal issues, like this Red River Rebellion. His problem was that not only did the Canadians lack experienced troops, but Gladstone was all too aware that any power vacuuming Manitoba could be exploited by the Americans. Reluctantly, Prime Minister Gladstone agreed to send regular British troops to support Macdonald. However, his agreement came with conditions. Firstly, any British force must be accompanied by a larger force of Canadians. Second, that once order had been restored, the British would not garrison Manitoba. They would be heading home. Thirdly, a political settlement had to be in place prior to the military expedition setting out. And finally, this was not to be a punitive expedition. In other words, this was not about punishing or subjugating the Mete population. It was a neat move by Gladstone. After all, the Canadian Premier's request for military assistance was to ensure peace, not conquest. With a political settlement, the Manitoba Act, in place and boxed in by Gladstone on the fourth point, Macdonald agreed. 400 British soldiers were now made available. They were the 1st Battalion of the 60th Regiment of Foot, the King's Royal Rifles. As agreed, the Canadians would provide the greater part of this force. 800 militiamen would form two battalions, one from Ontario, one from Quebec. Recruitment for the Canadian contingent didn't go as planned. Whilst the English-speaking Protestant population of Ontario, whipped up by the execution of Scott, rushed to join up, the response in Quebec was muted. Here, the French-speaking Roman Catholic population had a lot more sympathy for the Mete. In the end, the Quebec Battalion had to augment its ranks from the English-speaking population of the New Canada. The leader of this expedition would be a 37-year-old British Army officer, Garnet Walsley. Walsley was a veteran of the wars in Crimea, the Indian Mutiny and the Opium Wars in China, and was already stationed in Canada as Deputy Quartermaster General. It would be the first time that he would lead a military campaign, and it certainly wouldn't be the last. The Red River Expedition, sometimes called the Walsley Expedition, would put him firmly on the map as a future leader. In fact, apart from his battlefield experience, and he'd lost an eye in the Crimean War and taken a bullet in his leg during the Second Anglo-Burmese War, his star was already on the rise, having written the uh, Soldier's Pocket Book for Field Service the previous year. The book was synonymous with Wolseley's attention to detail and his careful planning, which would be the hallmarks of his successful campaigns in the future. And all of that was put into action in Canada in 1870. His army consisted of those two Canadian battalions, along with his British battalion of the 60th Foot, King's Royal Rifle Corps. Wolseley also requested some Royal Engineers to assist with getting his expedition through the wilderness, and members of the Army Commissariat to provide logistical support supplying his column. And finally, his Red River expedition would be accompanied by four seven-pound artillery guns, just in case. The expedition to the Red River was a challenge to say the least. The biggest challenge for Wolseley was not Louis Riel and his armed supporters, but the sheer distance needing to be covered and the lack of roads available. Whilst today you can travel between Toronto and Winnipeg on roads for over 1300 miles, back in 1870 there were no roads for most of this journey. Wolseley would have to take a force of over 1000 men through 1300 miles of untamed wilderness where few people had gone before. How long could that take? Based upon the British advance in Zululand in 1879, which was a different and possibly kinder terrain, it's not unreasonable to consider 10 miles a day through the Canadian wilderness pretty good going. Based upon that speed, it would take Wolseley between four and five months to get to Fort Garry. What toll would hacking their way through the 1300 miles of forests and trying to negotiate the countless lakes and rivers physically take on his army? And let's not forget the 400 armed men at Fort Garry. What have they decided to put up a fight? Wolseley pondered his options and came up with a bold plan. He wouldn't hack his way through the forests and try to cross those countless waterways. He would transport his whole army up 
the waterways. 1,200 men, hundreds of miles up rivers, riddled with 47 rapids, across lakes, including the massive lakes Superior and Huron, all the way to Fort Garry itself. It would also involve potentially taking his army through American territory. And this was his better option. What could possibly go wrong? The Red River expedition left Toronto on the 31st of May, 1870. A 94 mile railway journey took Wolseley's force to Collingwood on the shores of George's Bay. From here, they boarded steamers that had been specially chartered to carry the expedition through George's Bay and then across Lake Huron. It was when they tried to navigate the narrow waterway connecting Lake Huron to Lake Superior that they ran into a major obstacle, the Americans. Technically, the waterway was split between Canada and the USA. The first steamer passed through the narrow waterway connecting the lakes at uh, Sault Ste. Marie without the Americans raising an eyebrow. And then, orders from President Grant in Washington. No British army was going to march or need steam through US territory. The Americans closed their side of the waterway. There was no way through. What could Wolseley do? Well, apart from forcing his way through and creating a serious international incident, which wasn't in his brief, Wolseley was stuck. But then the man who would later be dubbed Britain's only general had an idea. The Americans were denying passage to the British and Canadian army, but not the vessels themselves. So he disembarked his men and war materials on the Canadian side of the waterway. And then they marched on the Canadian bank all the way to Lake Superior, dragging their four artillery guns along with them, whilst the ships sailed alongside. Put that in your pipe and smoke it, President Grant. <laughs> Us Brits can be so bloody minded. International incident avoided and President Grant thwarted, Wolseley's flotilla sailed 260 miles across Lake Superior to Thunder Bay. This was the end of the line for the steamers and they were still 600 miles short of their destination. <laughs> now the fun would really begin. The good news was that the Canadian government were on the case. Simon Dawson from the Public Works Department had been tasked with building a road through the forest to take them to the next lake. However, the British commander found that Dawson had not made as much progress as he'd been led to believe. Deciding that the road was not fit for purpose, Wolseley embarked his whole army into canoes that he'd brought along specifically for the waterways ahead. Each of these sturdy canoes contained eight or nine soldiers, plus two or three voyageurs. The voyageurs were skilled boatsmen, many of them from the First Nation peoples, experienced in navigating the fast-flowing Canadian rivers. Not only did the voyageurs transport Wolsey's men, but also their ammunition and 60 days worth of provisions. It was a heck of an undertaking. Whilst the voyageurs were responsible for navigating the canoes, the soldiers, both British and Canadian, were required to do the rowing. They were also required to carry the canoes and all the supplies past each set of rapids, and there were 47 of them on the route to Fort Garry. Wolseley had planned for this regular manhandling of the supplies. Prior to setting out back in Toronto, he had ensured that most of the supplies were packed into small enough quantities to be carried manually. This expedition allowed Wolseley to have a free reign in planning his campaign thoroughly. One of the reasons he was to give for his success was that they were so far away from the telegraph lines to London, he could get on without War Office micromanagement. However, Wolsey himself was a micromanager. Everything was planned to the last detail. It became a hallmark of his career. Mosquito oil and veils were provided to protect his men from the infamous insect attacks around the Great Lakes. Being British and bloody minded, many of his men from the 60th Regiment decided not to use these accessories for their intended purpose. Instead, they used the veils to strain lake water for drinking and the oil to burn in their lamps. Oh well, you can but try. The Red River expedition also showed how Wolseley was willing to adapt stiff British Army protocols to suit the environment he was fighting in. He replaced British made axes, which he claimed looked like something handed down from the Anglo-Saxons, for axes used by Canadian backwoodsmen. And whilst the men of the 60th King's Royal Rifle Corps wore green rather than red tunics, which wasn't a bad colour in the Canadian forests, he was happy for them to cast them off and row in their shirts. Likewise, he encouraged his men to replace their traditional black metal shod boots with locally acquired moccasins. For Wolseley, it was all about winning. 
and throughout his career he would constantly seek to adapt and reform the British Army to achieve that purpose. It was also in this campaign that he started to gather around him a group of officers who would eventually form his shanty ring. He would enlist officers from that ring to form his core subordinates in his future campaigns, almost like his own personal general staff. One of the earliest of the Ashanti Ring to catch his eye on this campaign was a captain in the 60th Regiment, Redvers Buller. Wolseley noted that Buller was, quote, full of resource and personally absolutely fearless. Those serving under him trusted him fully. Those were traits that Buller would keep throughout his long military career. Even after the disasters of Black Week in the Boer War, he remained popular amongst the rank and file soldiers. They made their way up the Rainy River negotiating 17 rapids before entering the Lake of the Woods. It was here that another one of Wolseley's future Ashanti ring joined them, Lieutenant William Francis Butler. Five years younger than fellow Irishman Wolseley, the two had met during the Second Anglo-Burmese War, where Wolsey had taken that musket ball in the thigh. As news spread that an expedition was to be launched to the Red River, the 32-year-old Butler got in touch asking to join. By the time Wolseley received his letter, he had filled his staff positions. Nevertheless, he had a high regard for Butler and brought him on board to conduct a special assignment to ascertain the situation at Fort Garry. Travelling through the USA, not in uniform, he entered Manitoba and made his way to the fort on the Red River. And there he actually had a meeting with the rebel leader, Louis Riel. He then acquired a canoe and crew and headed off to meet Wolseley coming in the opposite direction. With an update from Butler, Wolseley moved from the Lake of the Woods into the Winnipeg River. In the lead canoe made of birch bark, Wolseley literally led the expedition from the front. The Winnipeg River was the hardest physical barrier to overcome. They had to offload and carry their canoes past 30 portages or rapids, some of which were nearly a mile long. Whilst I said earlier that the supplies had been packed into more manageable sizes, I mean, they were more manageable than usual, rather than as light as a feather. Most of the time, teams of men would manhandle the supplies, but some characters were noted for their strength. Redford's Buller, for instance. He carried a barrel weighing 300 pounds, 136 kilograms, on one occasion. Even more impressive, the future Duke of Somerset carried two barrels of pork weighing 400 pounds, single-handed. Finally, on the 20th of August, they came out of the river onto Lake Winnipeg. The following day, they set off down the lake, and on the 24th of August, they entered the Red River, travelling the short distance to Fort Garry. It had taken just seven weeks to make this incredible journey. Despite boats overturning, Wolseley had not lost a single man under his command. And despite being attacked by swarms of mosquitoes and black flies, not a single man was signed off sick. His rapid progress through the waterways of Canada had taken the Mete at Fort Garry by surprise. Wolseley's men advanced on the fort through thick mud and driving rain, only to find it deserted. The revolt had collapsed. Fearing for his life, Louis Riel fled for the safety of America, leaving his breakfast on the table. Redford's Buller, a man who always enjoyed a good meal, didn't miss the opportunity and tucked in. Without losing a single man, Wolseley covered 600 miles across the wilderness and through waterways in just 96 days. And then he'd effectively stopped the rebellion in its tracks without firing a single shot. The campaign had cost £300,000, of which London only had to fork out 100000 The Canadians footed the rest of the bill. The Canadians were able to continue their westward advance and Manitoba joined Canada as a province, not a colony. And true to Gladstone's promise, the British troops were soon on their way home. Wolsey had managed to do what most generals don't. His troops were home for Christmas. Wolsey's star was now on the rise. He would become the preeminent British general in the second half of the 19th century and ultimately become the commander in chief of the British army. Several officers had gained valuable experience in both intelligence work, in the case of Butler, and in logistics and supplies, in the case of Buller. Interestingly, there was someone else involved in Wolseley's supply operation in the Red River Expedition who deserves a brief mention. A staff sergeant in the Commissariat. Within a year of the Canadian Expedition, this NCO was to retire after 21 years' service. He emigrated to South Africa, where at the end of the decade he volunteered his services to Lord Chelmsford in the Zulu War. 
James Langley Dalton would receive the Victoria Cross for his actions at the Battle of Rook's Drift. Meanwhile, Wolseley became convinced that wars would be won by meticulous planning, just as he had done in Canada. He'd put this experience into practice just three years later with a victory in the Ashanti War, and then in Egypt in 1882. He would go on to lead the attempt to rescue Gordon in Khartoum in the 1880s. Once more, he decided to conduct a waterborne expedition all the way up the River Nile. And to assist him, he would call upon those same voyageurs who'd helped him achieve his very first success in the Red River expedition. Many argue that the delay as those men were gathered and then transported across the Atlantic lost crucial time and would cost Gordon his life. The Red River expedition was the last British-led military expedition in North America. Louis Riel would return to Canada and in 1885 lead another uprising, the Northwest Rebellion, sometimes called the Second Riel Rebellion. It was put down and Riel executed. But this time, Canada did not need British support. They could handle things themselves. In future, rather than Britain coming to Canada's assistance, it would be the other way round. When Canada and Newfoundland sent their sons to fight alongside the British in both the First and the Second World Wars. Thanks for watching and I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, then please give me a like and subscribe to my channel. Or how about joining my supporters club? And don't forget to check out the rest of my videos. There are over 100 available now. Lots more stories coming your way. But until then, thanks for your support. Keep well, and I'll see you very soon.